Good afternoon, all. And uh, thank you for attending our Sexting, Gender, and Health and Disease uh, special interest group, interest group meeting today. And uh, what I'd like to do, and thank you, um, Elizabeth, for opening up the meeting. I'd like to say that on behalf of the Office of Research on Women's Health, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this meeting of the Sexting, Gender, and Health and Disease scientific interest group. For those who haven't been with us before, the purpose of this uh, special interest group, scientific interest group is to explore the influence of sex as a biological variable and gender as a social construct on health and disease across the lifespan. The SIG aims to promote the dissemination of research and foster potential interdisciplinary collaborations among NIH scientists who work on or who are interested in aspects of sex-based research across the research continuum or in sex differences research relevant to health and disease. The SIG also serves as a platform for cross-disciplinary connections. And uh, you might see in this slide that you can join the SIG and subscribe to our mailing list from the SIG webpage. And we invite those of you who aren't yet members of the SIG to join us. <laughs> oh, my apologies. <laughs> uh, if you aren't a member of the SIG, we invite you to join us. If you'd like to receive information from today's SIG by email, please put your name and email address in the chat. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Elizabeth Barr, who will now introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Dr. Catherine Dalkey, MD, MBE, is a psychiatrist specializing in the mental health of adolescents and adults who are LGBTQ or have intersex traits. Dr. Dalkey is an assistant professor in the departments of psychiatry and behavioral health and humanities at the Penn State College of Medicine, where she also directs the Office for Culturally Responsive Healthcare Education. Dr. Dalkey served on the consensus committee for the report, Understanding the Well-Being of LGBTQI plus Populations at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. She was recently appointed to the consensus committee for the National Academy's follow-up study on measuring sexual and gender diverse populations. Dr. Dalkey is a member of the Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office Working Group at NIH, a longstanding and visible advocate for people with intersex variations. Dr. Dalkey has been recognized for her community work appointment with the Pennsylvania Commission on LGBTQ Affairs and several advocacy awards. Dr. Dalkey is a graduate of Haverford College and the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, from which she earned her MD and a master's in bioethics. She completed her psychiatry residency training at the University of Pennsylvania. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Katie Dalkey for today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Barr, for having me um, and for the and Dr. Hunter for the framing and introduction. Um, as I'm sharing my screen, um, I will start to talk with you a little bit about what the focus of our conversation is going to be. So as Dr. Barr mentioned, I was a consensus committee member and co-author on a report that was published by the National Academies last October that focused on the well-being of LGBTQI plus populations. And, and what I wanted to do today was provide you some information about the background and process of the report um, and do a bit of a deeper dive into what we learned about mental health and mental health disparities in LGBTQI populations. As we talk through this, I'll spend um, probably more time actually than you might expect talking about the other areas of the report. Um, but my, my goal in doing so is to help you understand really that mental health outcomes and mental health disparities among LGBTQI plus populations are really a downstream effect of a wide variety of um, phenomenon, stigma, discrimination across society. 
Um, as we move into the conversation, I have no relevant financial conflicts to disclose. Um, I do want to acknowledge, however, that you know, my discussion of this topic is influenced by my positionality and my personal relationship to the material. Um, I do also want to acknowledge that uh, the language that we use in the report is very specific and may not necessarily reflect the language that's used by people in different communities. Um, and finally, that part of our conversation today does include discussions of uh, structural and interpersonal violence. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, the National Academies um, serves as a group of independent nonprofit institutions that works to help policymakers um, and other institutions, including the National Institutes of Health, to make informed decisions based on review of the best available evidence. Um, the goal of National Academies reports is always to provide unbiased and authoritative advice that's really heavily grounded in and influenced by the best available information. Um, and evidence, excuse me. Um, committees are very intentionally composed to avoid conflicts of interest um, and are built to be a neutral venue for open dialogue and discussion. The Committee on Population at the National Academies was charged with undertaking a consensus study uh, with this very specific goal, which was to review the available data and future research uh, areas on person needs, excuse me, on persons with diverse sexualities and genders. Um, and importantly, uh, intersex folks or people with differences in sex development was very intentionally included um, in LGBTQ plus populations. And the idea was to not just focus specifically on sort of a set set of outcomes, but to look across multiple intersecting dimensions across the life course. The domains that were suggested as part of our overview were, were pretty broad and as you see range from um, patterns of stigma, violence and victimization, relationships with families, cultural and educational institutions, civic engagement, um, socioeconomic status, engagement with the legal system, social change, and then population health and well-being. Our, our study committee was constructed to reflect that really wide range of uh, domains that we were invited to, that we were charged, excuse me, to consider. Uh, we have on our committee, we have psychologists, legal scholars, epidemiologists, um, clinicians, and, um, and e economists, sociologists. Um, and I can say that the, our committee having this really diverse set of uh, academic expertise made for a really interesting and engaging discussion. Um, and I think as you'll see some really interesting and rich findings in the report. I do also want to acknowledge that we had an excellent staff that worked very hard to support us, um, including a consultant, um, Dr. Kellen Baker. And I do also want to give credit specifically to Drs. Kellen Baker and Dr. Jordan White, um, who were directly involved in um, helping me craft the slides that I'm using today. So as you can see, so the report, as I mentioned, was published in 2020, and the project began um, in 2018 with an initial planning meeting on the demography of sexual and gender minorities. In 2019, the National Academies held an expert meeting on the demography of sexual and gender minorities and follow up to that planning meeting. And then we held an open stakeholder session at our first meeting in 2019, and then another open amplifying visibility seminar in 2019, um, the, the latter of which was really designed to make sure that we were gathering as much information from perspectives that were not represented on the committee. One of the most, I think, interesting um, decisions that we as a committee made was actually choosing to use the language sexual and gender diverse throughout the report. Um, I want to be really clear that in no way are we recommending that this be terminology that researchers or policymakers should be using, because it really does not come from communities. This was our way of capturing really two things. The first is that our understandings of sexual orientation, gender identity, and physical sex, and the terms that we use to describe these understandings are really constantly evolving. Uh, within that, um, that diamond there, you can see just a selection of some of the terms that are used within communities um, and also within research and policy to try to describe these populations or to, for the population to describe themselves. 
And over the course of my own career, I've seen these terms fluctuate really significantly. So part of the, the challenge was finding language that was encompassing and agile enough to honor and reflect that constant evolution and shift in understanding. The other reason that we chose the language in, uh, particularly uh, deciding not to use the language of sexual gender minority is to reflect a growing understanding that these experiences are a part of normal and broad spectrum of human variation along these axes of sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex development. So the term we liked really because it reflected um, the goal to be affirming and validating of these normal of human variations, but also to be agile and encompassing enough of the, of the huge variety of identities and experiences under this umbrella. I also want to say that as we thought about well being, we thought about well being really broadly, both in terms of subjective markers of well being, things that folks were um, describing and reporting themselves, but also objective findings of well being um, across not just health, but across a wide range of economic and socio cultural findings as well. You can see here under the orange, at the, with the orange bullet points at the bottom, that we really focused on eight sort of central domains of well being being law and legal systems, public policy, community and civic engagement, family and social relationships, education, economics, and then physical and mental health and access to evidence-based health services. One of the reasons that we, we actually list, we have, um, I think physical and mental health is chapter 11, I wanna say in the report, and is really the penultimate chapter on these domains of well-being. Is, was that was a decision that was made very intentionally because as I mentioned before, as we worked our way through the evidence base and the literature, we really found that physical and mental health disparities are downstream effects of phenomena and disparities that are occurring at each of those previous domains of well being. So now what I'll do is start to walk through some of the findings of the report for you and we'll come to physical and mental health um, after providing some broad overview of the other aspects. Um, I do also want to say that we used a set of theoretical frameworks for approaching and understanding these diverse populations. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail about these today, except to say that we worked very hard to be inclusive of the theoretical frameworks that uh, both helped both helped us understand how disparities evolve and how resilience evolves as well, um, but also frameworks that had empirical evidence to support their use in this report. So as we move into the first domain, which was demography, um, some of the key findings from our um, review of the demography literature is that the visibility of sexual and gender diverse populations is, has been consistently increasing. Also that social climates around sexual and gender diversity are overall generally improving. And this in particular, by the way, I should have said earlier, I apologize, is with respect to a report that was issued by the National Academies in 2011, um, specifically from the Institute of Medicine on the health of LGBTQ populations. And since that 2011 report, we really saw a, a marked um, increase in population visibility and uh, improvements in social climates. However, um, demographic analyses, and in particular being able to generate accurate um, estimates of prevalence of different kinds of identity groups and identity populations were complicated by rapidly changing trends within the populations that we're looking at, specifically finding that populations, sexual and gender diverse populations are becoming younger, more racially diverse with a wider range of languages um, and descriptors that people are using along with this, and also more inclusive of bisexual people, especially women, who may identify as sexual gender diverse, but be in, for example, a heterosexual relationship. We also found that fluctuations in political and legal environments, and as you'll see, that varies, the fluctuations are not just over time, but even geographically or regionally complicated demographic analyses. Um, but really, perhaps most um, strikingly above all was a really widespread lack of data collection, broadly speaking, on sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status. And it's very hard to, to draw conclusions about what these populations look like when we're not collecting data 
um, on who who identifies as being as who either identifies as being as part of this one of these populations um, or who uh, could be identified by another person as being situated within one of these populations. We found in particular that sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status were pretty inconsistently included in a variety of um, data resources, including public and private population surveys, clinical trials, and other research studies. That in particular is a major um, focus of work of the Sex and Gender Minority Research Office um, for you all at NIH. Administrative data systems um, across public and private sectors and electronic health records. And that we really need this data in particular in order to drive research agendas, monitor population trends, guide resource allocation for policymakers, and also to inform policies to advance equity for sexual and gender diverse populations. So you can see that the, as a committee, we felt very strongly that having access to this data is really central to being able to advance um, the things that are important to improve the health and well-being of LGBTQI plus folks. So in our chapter on law and legal system, what we found is that overall is that there has been um, steady improvement in the treatment of sexual and gender diverse people across the US, but not uniformly. Um, and in particular, that we find that gaps in the existence and enforcement of legal protections are particularly harmful to people of color transgender folks and low income folks as well. And the laws and policies that we were looking at and can be grouped into two broad categories. The first are laws and policies that, that promote protection from harm. Some really specific examples of this are laws that are um, that impose penalty, uh, specific penalties for hate crimes that are motivated because of sexual orientation or gender identity or intersex status non-discrimination protections, including religious exemptions. And then on the other side of that coin are laws that actively affirm a sexual and gender diverse person's identity and autonomy. And these are things like marriage equality, access to public spaces, and access to gender affirming and reproductive health care. Um, that last example of access to health care, we'll talk a lot more about uh, in a couple of minutes. Just to give you a visual representation of what this looks like. So this report comes, this graphic comes from the Movement Advancement Project. It was not included in the report, um, but it's a graphic representation of how variable, how variable, excuse me, the legal climates are for sexual and gender diverse people across the US. So the dark green are climates that are rated as being very high, um, very highly supportive or tolerant of, of sexual and gender diverse populations. And the red, um, the red color denotes overall negative policy tally. And again, this is this is a visual representation of that balance of laws that are either like presently actively discriminatory or laws that are actively present or that are actively protective. Excuse me. So from um, from from the law and policy chapter, one of the other things that we spent a lot of time thinking about and discussing is that law and policy is an important driver of health, partly because it is a mechanism of structural stigma. So structural stigma we came to understand as um, something that is fundamentally built into systems of power, like law and policy, and serves three primary functions. Um, it serves the functions of dominating and exploiting people, uh, serves the, the function of enforcing norms, and also serves the function of excluding people. So one of the, the more sort of succinct ways of describing these is that structural stigma keeps people down in the positions of relative inferiority and uh, lack of power, keeps people in a very narrow sort of space and uh, conduct of behavior, and keeps people away from folks who are in the in-group. And the reason this is so important is because there's an emerging and, and significant body of evidence that suggests that structural stigma, as in particular as it plays out in law and policy, is a major determinant of health. So for example, there are, there's evidence to suggest that pre and post 
marriage equality, we saw dramatic changes in LGBTQ population health. So st states that went from having no marriage equality to having marriage equality saw improvements in the mental health of LGBTQ people in that state. And in some studies actually found an improvement in the mental health of people who are not LGBTQ after marriage equality. Another more recent example of this is the passage of anti-bullying statutes has also been correlated with improvement of mental health and reduction in suicidal behavior in particular for LGBTQ adolescents. But at the same time, as I indicated, you know, this is an emerging evidence base um, and we, we can conduct quasi-experimental studies to understand the relationship between policies and outcomes. But there, there, this is a really sig important and significant research gap in which we need innovative research and data collection efforts to better understand how stigma has the effect of, um, has uh, effects, excuse me, sexual and gender diverse population health. This is another example um, of structural stigma uh, that's been very much, I think, top of mind for a lot of folks over the last several months, which are the passage of bans specifically on transgender youth uh, being able to participate in sports. And the orange states here are states that have passed legislation that's as of July um, that had specifically banned trans students from participating in sports consistent with their gender identity. So this is, a, this is just another example very specifically of what structural stigma looks like. So as we move on to community and civic engagement, um, what, we, what we found is that access to safe and safe and affirming physical and virtual social spaces is really essential to the well-being of sexual and gender diverse populations. And this is because community serves some really important roles in LGBTQI plus well-being. Community helps to build connectedness, helps to promote resilience and foster inclusion, provides access to very tangible and intangible forms of support. So specifically guidance, information sharing, in a lot of cases sharing material resources like food, money, um, housing, for example. And also that when people are engaged in community, they're, they're more socially engaged, they're less isolated. Um, they become more mobilized and can become more in, involved in advancing socio-political causes that are important to well-being. We also found that LGBTQI plus community organizations exist in all parts of the US across a wide range of not just states, but also settings from rural to urban settings and in all domains of life across all age groups. Um, in particular, uh, there's some really nice work done illustrating that Black Pride celebrations in particular serve as a really important opportunity for some folks to be able to experience and affirm their identities and create community in an intersectional space. But at the same time, we also found that affirming spaces are vanishing. Um, a lot of affirming spaces grew up in particular around lesbian and gay bars, for example, which have increasingly closed across the US. And not all sexual and gender diverse people have equal access to the spaces that have existed or remain. Um, in particular, LGBTQ youth who may not be independent with respect to transportation or finances may not be able to get to physical spaces um, or other folks who have difficulties with, um, with uh, transportation or economic resources. So this is a really important area for us to be thinking about in research is, is the role that community plays in well-being and also in policy, how we can look to protect access to those really important spaces. So looking at family and social relationships as a, as a kind of more microscopic or microcosmic, I should say rather, um, sort of view of community, we found that relationships are really critical to the development of well-being of sexual and gender diverse youth and adults. Um, it, it turns out that having, having good relationships and having affirming relationships in particular are important to promote health and that the most, the, the research suggests that the most central or important relationships are those with parents, teachers, peers, and romantic partners. Um, 
we also found that there was a, which I apologize is not included on the slide. We also found that there's evidence to suggest that lesbian and gay adults in particular um, with the passage of marriage equality are able to become parents more easily and more frequently than in previous generations. Um, and that this serves a really important role in creating community and uh, in, cre in amplifying visibility as well of lesbian and gay relationships. But on the other side of the coin, we also found that for many, but not all sexual and gender diverse people, family and social relationships can be strained as a function of stigma, uh, which can be associated with negative health consequences. And you'll see there are sp some specific examples of that when we come to mental health. When it comes to education and economic settings, uh, we found that many sexual and gender diverse people really experience poor treatment in education environments and a lack of economic opportunity throughout their lives. So what, what I mean by this is that um, LGBTQI students are disproportionately experiencing bullying and harassment from peers and teachers in educational settings that LGBTQI plus people tend to have lower educational attainment. Um, but even when people have comparable educational attainment, we see reduced access to economic sources, resources, including employment and income, credit and housing, public assistance and means testing services. And that these disparities seem to be particularly pronounced for transgender and bisexual people, lesbian women, and LGBTQI plus people of color. There, there, um, the Bostock decision in 2020 that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act prohibits employment discrimination against LGBT people um, is really significant, but what exactly that means and how that will play out um, in employment issues and in economic indicators is still not yet known. Okay, so now moving on more specifically to physical and mental health, which I know is really the more kind of immediate reason that you're all here to see me today. So the punchline, which I'm sure will be surprising to almost nobody on the call, is that sexual and gender diverse populations really face significant and numerous and persistent physical and mental health disparities. And before I go into what those disparities are, I want to be really clear about what we found as the major influences and determinants of those disparities are. So specifically, we found that these disparities are overwhelmingly driven by social forces like stigma, prejudice and discrimination, and that they do not reflect intrinsic personal characteristics related to sexual orientation, gender identity, or intersex status. So what I mean by that is that there is no evidence to suggest that LGBTQI plus people are inherently less physically or mentally healthy than any other person, but that the social environment in which people find themselves leads to these health disparities. We also find that health disparities are unevenly distributed according to factors such as race and gender. So we see variations across health disparities depending on a person's racial group or their gender identity. Um, and that these health disparities can specifically be compounded by intersecting stressors such as racism, sexism, and xenophobia. However, at the same time, at a very 20,000 foot view, what we observed is that there's an overall lack of research in particular outside of the world of HIV that explicitly includes and prioritizes sexual and gender diverse populations. And that when we look in even more specifically at intervention research, what we actually do to reduce the impact of health disparities and promote health, the majority of intervention research has really focused on HIV and yet more work is still needed both on HIV and on other individual and structural interventions for other health concerns. So what's interesting about this actually, when we, when we take a step back and look at this, and in particular at the research disparity, it suggests that the most important thing when we're talking about LGBTQI health is HIV, um, which I think runs the risk actually of reinforcing some assumptions and stigma about the kinds of behavior that LGBTQI folks are engaged in, the kinds of sex that LGBTQI folks are, are engaged in, and what the concerns of LGBTQI folks are. So let's take a bit of a deeper dive and look in some more detail at the physical and mental health disparities. So the physical health disparities we found um, were, could be grouped into five major categories, which were overall general health and well-being, cardiovascular disease, cancer, 
sexual and reproductive health, and then experiences of violence and victimization. Um, with each of these, um, with each of these domains, again, the majority were really associated with experiences of social stress and stigma. The, there are a couple that I wanted to point out that are not necessarily specifically pertinent to social stress and stigma, um, which is in cancer, for example. So there is some evidence that breast and anal cancer, breast cancer in lesbian women um, and anal cancer in gay men do have something to do with um, a person's physiologic risk factors. So for example, breast cancer is more common in people who have never had a pregnancy. Um, anal cancer is more common in people who have receptive anal intercourse and have HPV um, or HIV. Uh, but there are also structural factors and social factors that influence those disparities. So access to screening for breast cancer or anal cancer, for example, um, experiences of discrimination in the healthcare setting, for example, also influence those cancer disparities. On the other hand, germ cell and gonadal cancer, we really found where the disparity primarily exists among folks with intersex variations, which is a direct effect of how a person's gonadal tissue develops as a function of their intersex variation or difference of sex development. Similarly, with sexual and reproductive health, some of that is related to the kind of sex that people are having um, or the need for assisted reproduction or infertility may be related to the kind of sex that a person is having. Um, but access to fertility treatment, for example, access to HIV and STI screening, for example, are also a function of the social environment. When we looked at health disparities for behavioral health, we found that consistently across studies, across systematic reviews and meta-analyses, um, there were consistent increased risks for mood and anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders, substance use disorders, and serious mental illness, um, as well as what, what we refer to as the suicidality spectrum. And the suicidality spectrum refers to everything from what's called non-suicidal self-injury. So this is self-harm for the purpose primarily of relieving tension or stress, like cutting or burning, for example, all the way up through suicidal thinking or ideation to suicide attempts or completed suicide or death by suicide. For each of these health disparities, we found that the health disparities begin to appear in adolescence. Um, which is consistent for mental health problems across the board. There's something about um, the neurodevelopmental and hormonal milieu of adolescence, as well as the stress of adolescence that seems to uncover mental health problems, but that these health disparities really do persist into and through adulthood, even into older adulthood. As we looked at the intersectional analysis of health disparities, in particular with respect to specific groups, so most studies that are looking at um, health disparities for LGBTQI populations are taking broad, broad um, survey data or um, health record analysis, for example, of people who are identified as LGBTQ. And then there are subgroup analyses for different identity groups. And what we found is that some identity groups, in particular bisexual folks, transgender people, intersex folks, and Black and Indigenous people of color, are all relatively understudied compared to white LGBTQI people and cisgender, lesbian, and gay populations. For bisexual people, there seems to be a higher rate of depression, eating disorders, suicidality, and substance use, in particular for women. For transgender people, we see higher rates of depression, anxiety, PTSD, eating disorders, suicidality. There's been a really nice body of research that's come out of the VA specifically looking at transgender veterans. Um, and one of, the, one of the findings that's been shown that replicated a couple of times in that literature is a higher rate of military sexual trauma for, uh, for transgender veterans. Intersex folks are a particularly interesting population in the, in the sense that there's almost no population health research for intersex people. And the majority of this work is done from clinical samples. Um, but what's also interesting, but those clinical samples um, suggest higher rates of depression and anxiety and suicidality for intersex youth and adults. 
But also interestingly about intersex populations is there's evidence to suggest that parents of especially young children with intersex variations experience significant behavioral health disparities, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress symptoms, and distress. When we look at people of color, there's some evidence actually that people of color may have lower rates of depression than white LGBTQI folks, um, but that there may be higher rates of suicidality and worse mental health related quality of life. So this is a way of underscoring a point that was made previously that at each of these experiences, unique social experiences related to a specific identity group, we do see variations within subgroups, but again, this is a relatively understudied area. One of the things that's I think really interesting to me as a psychiatrist um, and looking at this data is that the symptoms that we're seeing, um, and I, I can say this from having from having reviewed this literature, but also working clinically, is that these symptoms very often look like stress responses to stigma, discrimination, and violence. Um, Post-traumatic stress symptoms, feeling hypervigilant, being on edge and making sure that you're not at risk of being harmed, for example, is one way of actually coping with living in a world that is stigmatizing and discriminatory or responding to violence that you've experienced as a consequence of your sexual or gender identity. We also find that one of the things that seems to increase experiences of symptoms, severity of symptoms, but also correlates with reports of distress and diagnoses are measures of internalized stigma. So for example, the extent to which a person believes that they are um, to blame for what's happening to them, the extent to which a person experiences shame related to their sexual orientation, gender identity, or intersex status seems to correlate with symptom severity, um, experiences of victimization specifically, and also burden of adverse childhood events all correlate with symptoms, diagnoses, and distress. With respect to adverse childhood events, for those of you who are interested in mental health and stress and trauma, this is, this is an area that's had a, a lot of research across the, across the board. But one of the things that I have found particularly interesting and compelling about the ACEs literature for LGBTQI people um, is that there's some suggestion that LGBTQI youth may be more vulnerable to adverse childhood events in part because of their gender or sexual identity at a young age, the extent to which, for example, they present with behavior that's understood to be gender non-normative or gender atypical may make them more vulnerable to experiences of victimization or trauma in childhood. When we look at some of the subgroups that we've talked about, there's some evidence of association with, um, with some of these uh, stress responses and social drivers, although again, these are less well studied. In intersex populations, there's some evidence that um, experiences of shame and stigma increase mental health symptoms and being more open and having a higher self-esteem decrease those. I think one of the things that's really fascinating about uh, veterans is that there is conflicting evidence about this, that actually there's some evidence that being a military vet veteran can actually improve your mental health if you're LGBTQI, and there's some evidence that being a veteran can worsen your mental health. Um, for Black and Indigenous and people of color, we see that the effects of racism, uh, ableism, and xenophobia, excuse me, I shouldn't have included ableism there, that should be listed in a separate bullet for um, people with disabilities, but these other experiences of racism, ableism, and xenophobia can also drive mental health outcomes. When we look at substance use drivers, again, we see severity of substance use really seems to correlate with exposure to stress. Um, and one of the ways that we, we seem to understand this is that use of substances can be a way of coping with or managing these stressful experiences that we've talked about. Um, there's evidence for adolescents, for lesbian, gay, and bisexual adolescents that experiencing harassment at school on the basis of one's gender or sexuality increases use of substances for adults, discrimination and stressful life events. For transgender adults, discrimination, bullying, violence, family rejection, and also lack of affirmation of one's gender. And really importantly for intersex adults, there is no data at all on substance use. I think the other point that I do want to make that we discussed in the report as well is that one of the while experiences of stress do seem to drive substance use disparities, there's 
also the reality that a lot of LGBTQI community spaces, as I previously mentioned, are lesbian and gay bars. And so there's an extent to which the social life has historically been built around uh, the use of substances or being in spaces that center substance use. But also uh, there's been really intentional and targeted marketing from tobacco and alcohol companies at LGBTQI plus populations, which also seems to contribute to substance use disparities. So the minority stress model is one way of integrating some of what we're talking about here, which is to say that when you start over on the far left of the diagram, that having an LGBTQI plus identity plus another targeted identity based on your race, ethnicity, nationality, physical or uh, mental disabilities, um, in lead, make a person more vulnerable to these minority stressors, prejudice, discrimination, abuse, poverty, and gender non-affirmation. When we factor in barriers to care, uh, which we'll talk about more again in a moment, um, that can increase or compound the effect of these minority stressors. But when people have coping and resilience, this can diminish um, or reduce the impact of some of these minority distress stressors. But this, this sort of uh, system is what we see as really driving these health disparities. So when we talk about access to evidence-based health services, what's really important about this is we've made a very clear case that LGBTQI people really need quality mental and physical health care, um, both in the preventative and chronic and acute healthcare services to attend to these health disparities. And that these services need to be delivered in welcoming and affirming clinically appropriate and culturally responsive settings. Um, in particular, our access to evidence-based health services chapter focused on um, also on a couple of specific scenarios in which there's been a body of research that these particular, I'll use, I'll use interventions, I should say, that are sort of targeted for LGBTQI plus populations have the potential to be either dramatically helpful or potentially extremely detrimental. So gender affirming care, which includes a wide range of medical, mental health and surgical support for transgender and gender diverse folks has been very consistently associated with improved mental and physical health. Um, and the conclusion is that these are services that really should be accessible and covered. Um, at the same time, treatments like conversion therapy, um, which are uh, treatments that seek to change a person's gender identity or sexual orientation to make that person straight or cisgender, has no evidence of benefit and has significant evidence of harm even persisting into adulthood. Uh, with respect to mental health disparities. And then we also reviewed the literature on elective genital surgeries for children with intersex traits and found that while there's some evidence that these surgeries can confer some physical benefit, um, one of the major reasons cited for performing these surgeries is improving psychosocial well being and quality of life. And there's really no evidence that those surgeries do that in particular relative to not having surgery and a growing body of work and research that looks at um, these surgeries as being a violation of a child's human rights. So the, the concern about these two interventions is that sort of on the op from the opposite side of, of gender affirming care, that these, uh, these um, interventions, which are sometimes made available to people who are part of sexual and gender diverse populations are not evidence-based or potentially dangerous to health and well-being, and, and should not be performed or available. When we talk about specifically access to healthcare, there are some important disparities to keep in mind. One is that we see just disparities as far as who has insurance. We see lower rates of income, lower rates of employment, and higher rates of uninsurance. Um, even though uh, since that 2011 report was published, there were two really important policy shifts that increased access to care for LGBTQI plus populations, which were uh, Medicaid expansion under the ACA um, and same-sex marriage. Uh, we do still see these disparities persisting, albeit at a somewhat slightly reduced level um, prior to these policy shifts. However, there's also uh, evidence that even when people have access to insurance, that there are disparities um, and even potentially discriminatory practices within insurance coverage 
that has significant impacts for LGBTQI plus people. Um, so for example, when a person has um, previous HIV infection, um, or they may not be able to get insurance coverage. Um, some insurance companies pay uh, tier or list antiretrovirals for HIV treatment at a very high level, making those medications very expensive. And some really specific and evidence-based treatments for LGBTQI plus people like pre and post exposure prophylaxis for HIV, um, specific mental and behavioral health care, infertility treatments, gender affirming care and gender specific services may be excluded and often are excluded um, for many LGBTQI plus populations. And as a clinician who works with LGBTQI plus people in particular with transgender youth and adults, I can tell you that I see this every single day um, and it can be extremely frustrating for folks to see um, just how much it can delay access to care uh, that's really needed. This is, a, this is another visual representation from the Movement Advancement Project um, that looks in particular at states that have the, the state Medicaid policies for gender affirming care. So the green states are states where Medicaid explicitly covers healthcare related to gender transition for trans people. Again, medical, behavioral health and surgical treatment. The beige or yellow states are states that are silent um, on their Medicaid coverage. And orange states are states that explicitly exclude trans health coverage and care. Um, and I can tell you, and as I live in Pennsylvania, I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I'm right now about a mile and a half from the state capitol. Um, this is something that comes up almost every single legislative session. Um, and it, it's, um, it's an important understanding to really drive home the point that even when folks have access to care, they may not actually have access to care and that that access to care can be really tenuous and changeable. Finally, what one of the, the other important points to make is that even when people get into the doctor's office and they can get care covered, we see significant experiences of discrimination in healthcare settings. Um, this report of the, um, from a national public opinion study um, on the state of LGBTQ populations um, is representative of the findings we saw in other settings. So 20% of people overall and 47% of transgender people had experienced uh, discrimination in a healthcare setting because of their sexual and gender diversity. Nearly 30% of trans people had avoided seeking healthcare in the, need, in the previous year because of fear of discrimination. And 22% of trans people had been denied insurance coverage for preventative screenings based on gender. So this is an example, for, uh, for instance, when a transgender man who may still have breasts is denied access to a mammogram because his gender is male and his insurance company doesn't pay for mammograms for men. I think one of the other things that's in, that's in particular important to me in thinking about mental health treatment and psychiatry is that it's not just this expectation of rejection and stigma, um, the dual stigma referring both to stigma for mental health issues, as well as previous experiences, but also organized psychiatry's history of approaching um, sexual and gender diversity. Um, so this is, this is a graphic that comes from the American Psychiatric Association that tells the story of the inclusion and eventual exclusion of homosexuality um, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the, the book that we use to um, make mental health diagnoses in psychiatry. And as you notice in 1980, although um, homosexuality was removed, sexual orientation disturbance was um, retained, and this is where we introduced a mental health condition specifically pertinent to gender identity disorder. Um, the image on the left is um, Dr. Um, Dr. John Fryer, who testified anonymously at an APA meeting in 1972, I believe, who was a Philadelphia psychiatrist who had whose whose message, and so testifying was essentially to say, you know, I'm a psychiatrist. This does not make sense to say that we are categorically mentally ill but also interestingly was a psychiatrist based in Philadelphia who had lost two jobs over the course of his career because of being gay. So this is something that a lot of people are actually very keenly aware of. Um, and conversion therapy, while we now understand this as being sort of on the outskirts of mainstream mental health treatment, was part of organized psychiatry really, really up through the 1970s. 
So as we start to think about interventions, um, really the, the kind of the, the, the main takeaway for, for interventions is that we have very little data actually tells us, that tells us how to address in particular mental health disparities for LGBTQI plus populations. There's some evidence that targeted or specific psychotherapies for sexual and gender diverse people or assessing minority stress as part of mental health treatment may be helpful. Um, we often talk about specific treatment for LGBTQI plus people with substance use problems or providing culturally responsive care, but there's very little evidence to suggest that, that this actually is, is helpful, um, partly because there's little research that specifically looked at these things. What we do see though, and this kind of brings us back around full circle, is that when people are in supportive home and school environments, they live in states with equitable and non-discrimination laws, they're engaged in community, they have access to gender affirming medical treatment in particular, these are the kinds of things that really do seem to impact mental health at a population level. And we really need more data looking at the individual level and the community level as far as interventions. So in summary, as I'm starting to wrap up here, um, our recommendations from the report, you, you all can read these and you can also pull up the report and read them for yourself, but very broadly, the, the recommendations re recommend that we need to collect sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status more consistently. We need to refine and improve measures that accurately capture these experiences of sexual and gender diversity. That recommendation is what directly led to the second report that's in process that Dr. Barr mentioned at the beginning um, to develop research agendas that target these data gaps, look for innovative ways to share and link data across different settings, and to expand evidence-based programming and interventions to promote well-being and health. Um, these are our sponsors for the project. Um, the, our project consultant and dissemination lead, Dr. Baker's uh, contact information is listed here. Um, I also have included here some professional resources that are particularly helpful, especially with respect to um, mental health. Um, some specific family and patient resources that we provide often in clinical work. And I will leave here by saying thank you with a picture of my little one at our local pride festival from a couple of years ago. And with that, I will stop my share and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Dalkey. This was really fantastic. Um, as a reminder for folks, uh, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we will get through as many as we can. So the first question um, that has come in, you mentioned that social establishments for, establishments for LGBTQ folks like bars are decreasing. Was there any indication as to why this may be so? Yeah, so I think actually um, the, the trend seems to be related actually to a really good thing, which is the um, the development of other kinds of spaces for LGBTQ youth in particular, um, a growth in LGBTQ community centers that provide social opportunities and um, connections for youth, um, but also for kind of increasing visibility and integration um, into society. It, you know, historically speaking, LGBTQ plus folks needed bars because there were places where people could be open in a really secret and um, concealed, almost underground sort of space. And, and there isn't necessarily the cultural imperative for that kind of space anymore, where people can date more openly, go with their partner to any kind of bar. Um, the other trend that we saw as well is that the rise of um, being able to connect with people virtually through dating apps and websites as well has to some extent also obviated the need for a bar as being the primary means by which people can meet other folks. Thanks. Um, and then another question that has come in, um, can you give examples to clarify gender affirming treatment and care versus conversion therapy and whether the lack of evidence that you mentioned for conversion therapy's positive effects could be due to the age of that treatment? So I th that's, a, that's a very interesting question. So as far as gender affirming treatment um, and care versus conversion therapy. So when, when I use the term gender affirming care, I really mean any sort of 
behavioral health, medical or surgical care that um, sort of meets a person where they are in their own gender identity and gender goals and works with them to achieve what their gender identity and gender goals are. So that runs the gamut for very young transgender children. So, you know, early school age children who are five, six, seven years old, what gender affirming care looks like is supporting parents and using their child's chosen name and pronouns um, at home and at school. And there's evidence that providing that sort of support um, improves mental health for children that young. The other sort of, the other sort of, and the other sort of component would be for an adult who is interested in taking hormones and having surgery to align their body with their gender identity, and, and they may work with a mental health professional as part of the process of achieving those goals. So the key difference between gender affirming care and conversion treatment is conversion treatments sort of start from the assumption that um, gender, sexual or gender diversity is, is abnormal or dis distressing because uh, it, not because of social stigma, but because itself it's abnormal and work with the person to change them to be sex, to be a uh, straight or cisgender. Gender affirming care on the other hand, is about saying whoever you are is okay and we're gonna work together to figure out how to, to live your best life effectively. Um, I think that question about conversion to therapy is an interesting one. Um, there hasn't been really sort of uh, intentional and well-organized research in mainstream or organized psychiatry or psychology for a very, very long time. Um, but I think that what we found is that even when young people are in a home environment where their parents are even just trying to talk to them about these kinds of treatments, that correlates with worse mental health outcomes ranging from depression and anxiety and suicidal ideation. Um, so that's, I, I think that's an interesting question, um, but it seems to be, it seems to be somewhat less about the conversion treatment itself and more about the total lack of affirmation and support that drives that, that mental health disparity. Thank you so much. Um, we are at the end of our time today. Um, and so again, folks, if you, um, for attendees, if you are interested in receiving follow-up information, um, because there was not, just please put your name and email address in the chat and we will be sure to um, communicate with you following this meeting. Um, we also would like to invite you to save the date for the last Sex and Gender in Health and Disease webinar of the year, which will be taking place on November 16th, same time. And this will feature Dr. Polly Joseph speaking on sex and gender differences in taste and smell perception.